the last time we met, I established a principle for the overall context of Deuteronomy that I'm going to remind you of from time to time. It is that Deuteronomy should be looked at as more of a sermon from Moses than as a direct oracle in the mouth of God. Moses' sermon is much like the bulk of the Bible, very much like the New Testament, whereby what Moses speaks is divinely inspired. However, divine inspiration is a cooperative work between man and God, while God's oracles are a direct communication, usually in the form of instructions, from God to man. Therefore, while the words Moses spoke are completely trustworthy and true, we must also see them in an ever so slightly different light than in the first four books of Torah, whereby we had so much of the verbiage that began with, and the Lord said, thus and so. I think it would be fair to say that an important principle when considering the Word of God is that the weight carried by God's direct oracles, that is, the instruction that follows and the Lord says, these are greater than the personal words or thoughts of any man, whether that man is Moses or King David or the Apostle Paul, who, if he's not merely repeating God's words, is essentially sermonizing, or to think of it in the Jewish way of thought, which is how we need to think of it, midrashing. So to this point in Deuteronomy chapter 1, we have listened in as Moses began recounting the years of Israel's history of wilderness journey, and were informed that the date of this sermon is 39 years and 11 months since the day that the Pharaoh released Israel from his grip. Now, verse 19 <clears throat> begins Moses' reminder to the people. Now, this is the second generation of the Exodus crowd that he's talking to. Just why it was that they've been wandering as Bedouins in the desert regions of the Arabian and the Sinai peninsulas rather than than being permanently settled. And he explains that about 38 years ago, Israel, upon reaching Kadesh Barnea, on the southern edge of the land of Canaan, Moses commanded that the people should go forth and that <clears throat> they should begin to conquer the Canaanites. But the leaders balked. They asked Moses to send some scouts on ahead to evaluate the land and then come back with a report. Please note that this is new information. In the Numbers 13 account of the conquering of Canaan, there's no mention of Moses telling the people to begin the holy war for Canaan. In fact, in many ways, the Numbers account makes Moses compliant, if not complicit, in the decision not to go into the promised land and take it. So here we find out that the reason that the scouts were sent is because the people, meaning the leaders and the elders who represented the people, demanded that instead of just moving forward without reservation, which is what they should have done, a dozen leading men were sent to check things out first. Now, I'm going to tell you that I have read some commentary that makes it seem as though Moses is kind of embellishing the story of the scouts, maybe rewriting history a little bit to put his own actions into a more favorable light. And that Moses was essentially saying, you know, it's not my fault. Don't look at me. I tried to do the right thing. But that he succeeded, uh, rather he succumbed to the will of the people. I suspect there is some truth to this, as Moses was but a mild man. He was always been reluctant in his current role, and he wasn't a forceful leader. And I don't think there was any inaccuracy to what Moses is saying here. It's just that as humans, we tend to remember the parts of, the, of events that are a lot more favorable to us. 
And we tend to bend what we were thinking at the time to what actually happened. Now, I have no doubt that Moses exhorted the people to have no fear and to march upon Canaan, but he also found himself in a quandary when the leaders that he depended on insisted on caution. Leadership is a very tricky thing. People have to buy in to what you're doing on the one hand, yet on the other hand, what good is leadership if one but stands out, but, but stands up at the head of a group and conducts it to whatever everybody wants to do, takes a poll. See, this was Moses' dilemma, and I think it's one that probably many of us in here can identify with. Now, I want you to notice something in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 1, verse 20, that is not particularly unique in the Torah, but rather it is an excellent example of a principle that usually goes right over our heads. It says that there, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which, is, which the Lord God is giving to us. The principle is all summed up in the tense of the word giving. See, the Hebrew biblical language <clears throat> doesn't use past, present, or future tenses, as does English, although Modern spoken Hebrew has kind of adopted the use of tenses, these same tenses. That is, in English, something happened before, past, is happening now, present, or is going to happen in the future. But biblical Hebrew uses what's called perfect and imperfect tenses, or sometimes they'll call it complete and incomplete. The perfect is roughly equivalent to past and present. The imperfect is roughly equivalent to the future. But that rough equivalency is very rough. Here's the issue, and I'm only going to take a moment to generalize about it. Our modern day past, present, and future tenses are all about when an action is taking place. It's about time. It makes the context of the statement set in time. A past time, a current time, a later time. That's not how it works in Biblical Hebrew. And I stress the term Biblical Hebrew because again, modern Hebrew does make use of past, present, and future tenses. In Biblical Hebrew, the tenses of the scripture denote the state of the action that it's referring to. Is the action completed? Is it ongoing? The idea of when in time an action is happening is only inferred by the context of the overall statement. The verb tenses don't tell you. So in the statement of verse 20 where it says that the Lord is giving the hill country to the Amorites of the Amorites to Israel, the idea of it is that it's not happening right now, it's an ongoing process. You with me? The giving of the land has begun, it's not completed. Some translations of the Bible will say, will give to us, will give. Others say gives to us. Others say is about to give to us. The problem is that these translations are setting the event of the giving of the land of Canaan to the Hebrews in time. And these variations want to say it is either happening now or it's going to happen later in the future. That's not correct. And we see this same issue repeated throughout the Bible. Here in Deuteronomy, what is being expressed is that the Hebrews were simply somewhere in the long process of possessing the land of Canaan. And exactly where along the timeline that they are isn't implied. This problem with misunderstanding Hebrew verb tenses has created all kinds of issues in trying to understand prophecies. Prophecies, by our definition, are almost always future. That's how we think of it. That's not necessarily so. 
Because past, present, and future are so embedded in our Western languages, I usually try to explain the biblical prophecies by saying they happened in the past, like the return of exile of the Hebrews, but many of these same prophecies are also happen again in the future. But technically, it's not a matter of past or future. It's that there is a prophetic, a, a prophetic process. It's ongoing. Someday, it will be brought to its fullest completion. Now, Moses recounts that the 12 scouts returned with some samples of the fruits of the land of Canaan, along with the report is, it's a good land. But the people refused to go up and to take the land as the Lord God had commanded them to do because another part of the report was, oh, this task is going to be difficult and dangerous. The inhabitants were big and they were numerous and they were so many walled fortress cities. And the people responded, Yehovah must hate us. So they refused to go, refused to take the land. Now, let me remind you that the term, the people, almost always is in reference to the leadership. This was a tribal society. People didn't vote. So, even so, the leadership was thought of as being representative of the people in a certain sense. If the leadership of the tribe of Judah decided something, in the Bible it would say the people of Judah decided thus and so. This is important to grasp because what is happening here is that Moses is blaming the leadership council for this action of rebellion that proved so costly to the Israelites in terms of life and time. Moses says he did his best to try to convince the leadership council to put aside their fears and instead to trust and obey God. He reminded them that that fire cloud that they followed by day and night was proof. It was proof, visible proof, that Jehovah was with them and that he'd already gone ahead of them and secured the victory. But despite the extraordinarily powerful evidence of God's love for his people, his ability to do whatever he says he will do, the leadership dug in their heels and wouldn't go. And as a result, the Lord declared that not one of that evil generation would enter into the land he had set apart for his people. The evil generation was defined earlier for us. This was the men who were aged 20 years and older at the time of this incident. Now, every time I recall this incident of the 12 scouts, I can't help but have some fear and trepidation kind of vibrate through my body. Here was a society in which, particularly at this point in the journey, the tribal leaders decided autocratically what was going to occur. The general population had little choice but to follow or to pack up and leave. However, the leaders also knew that their decisions had to be generally popular and acceptable or they wouldn't survive as leaders for very long. Yet the Lord held the general population accountable for the actions and the decision and the rebellion of their leadership, although he assigned somewhat more accountability to the leadership. Now, how much more must God hold each of us accountable for the decisions of our leadership in a democratic nation in which we choose? those who lead us. And we have a process to remove those who lead us poorly. As much as we would like to, we cannot completely separate ourselves from our secular government leadership or from a church or a synagogue that we might attend. And neither can that leadership separate itself from the actions of those they lead. Moses did not enter the promised land. And he states on numerous occasions that it was on account of the people that he was barred. 
In other words, as the leader, he was ultimately responsible to God for the actions of his people. Now, our salvation in Yeshua is certainly on an individual by individual basis. But our earthly fates, oh, we're pretty much all bound up together as a group. Don't ever forget it. And the principle that we see in the Bible is that after the Lord's first major division of humans into Hebrews and Gentiles, the next division of people in God's eyes was as nations of people, groups of people. Nations hold a corporate responsibility before Yehovah. Entire nations will be judged together as a single group based on the decisions of that leadership and the overall actions of the people. That several individuals may be opposed to some rebellious or ungodly action, that doesn't exempt them, you, me, from suffering the national judgment that the Lord may, and in Revelation, the book of Revelation indicates he's going to, inflict. So it behooves us to fight tirelessly in our families and in our communities to uphold the Lord's name and his commandments, if for nothing, nothing else, for our own sake. Particularly for the sake of our nation, though. Now, Moses tells this new generation of Hebrews what eventually happened after their refusal to go into the promised land. The leadership acknowledged that they were wrong. The leadership said, well, we certainly don't want to be detoured back into the wilderness. We certainly don't want to be permanently barred from ever entering the promised land. And on the surface, you know what? This sounds like contrite hearts, full of repentance for the rebellion. And then they say, okay, okay, now we'll go up and fight, just as Jehovah has commanded us. But then the Lord says something to that that really ought to shake us up. He says, oh no, 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 no. Do not go up now and fight because I won't be in your midst. Oh my. But so anxious were they to regain merit in the Lord's eyes, all the more anxious, of course, to, a God, to avoid God's pronouncement of judgment upon them, the people then turned around and again ignored the Lord. And they tried to take the promised land on their own without his leadership, without his permission. See, the results were predictable and disastrous. Not taking the land when they were commanded to was rebellion. But taking the land, even hours or days later, when commanded not to take it, that's also a rebellion. The timing always belongs to the Lord as much as the deed. And that's tough for me. I have a hard time with that. I really like to fit everything into my time slots. I'm a very busy man, right? You feel that way? I'll do it, God. Just, can we do this tomorrow? I'll go talk to that person. Can I do it next week? No. Now follow this sequence. Because this pattern is no different in the New Testament. And it's certainly no different in our modern era. First, the Lord commands Israel to take the promised land. Second, the people become afraid. They hesitate. Third, the people decide they're going to stop. They're going to evaluate whether they agree with God on this matter. Fourth, they choose to disagree with God. Fifth, God calls this disagreement rebellion. He pronounces judgment on them. And sixth, the people upon hearing the judgment repent. They say, okay, okay, we've changed our minds. We'll do what you say. Seventh, God says, no, time's passed. My offer is revoked. My judgment stands. The door is closed. 
you may not enter. Can you see where I'm going with this? Etch this God principle in your minds and hearts because our lives depend on it. It's not always possible to recoup an opportunity lost by a failure of our faith. We Christians love to say, well, if God closes a door, he'll open a window. And while that certainly says, sounds nice, I say, not always and not necessarily. The close a door, open a window philosophy is what these Israelites were counting on. What was God's response to that? No. There comes a time in the life of an unbeliever that the offer of salvation can be rescinded. I don't know when that is. Certainly at death. But at what point before death, no man knows. But for the believer, we can sit on the sidelines for so long or follow our own ways for so long that when the consequences of our rebellion finally become apparent to us and we determine to go back and try to recoup those things that our lack of faith caused us to dismiss, doesn't often work. And considerably more often than not, those specific opportunities are permanently lost. They will never be recovered, at least not by us. Probably thousands of poems and epitaphs have been written over the centuries describing how you can't regain the past. Oh, I'm not saying that God won't recognize our repentance and he won't allow us joy and maybe in his time some other opportunity to serve him. But who among us that has reached a, an advanced age at least does not look back at lost opportunity. And we mourn it to some degree or another. And we mourn it, not necessarily because our lives are ruined or we don't have any hope, nothing like that, but because much pain, a lot of needless suffering, unfortunately often involving innocent parties, could have been the result. Or perhaps we see a great blessing that we turned down and others took advantage of. Our lives could have been so much more fruitful for the kingdom of God if only we had trusted and obeyed when given the opportunity. Israel could have been enjoying God's rest in God's land in a matter of months after leaving Egypt. Months! Instead, due to lack of faith, only the offspring of those who left Egypt were ever going to be permitted that rest. And no amount of repentance was going to change that. Not even for Moses. Let's move on to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is page 198. Deuteronomy chapter 2. <clears throat> then we turned and we began traveling into the desert along the road to the Sea of Suf, as Adonai had said to me. And we skirted Mount Seir for a long time. Finally, Adonai said to me, you've been going around this mountain long enough. Head north and give this order to the people. You are to pass through the territory of your kinsmen, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir. They will be afraid of you, so be very cautious. Don't get into disputes with them, for I'm not going to give you any of their land. No, not even enough for one foot to stand on, inasmuch as I have given Mount Seir to Esau as his possession. Pay them money for the food you eat. Pay them money for the water you drank. For Adonai your God has blessed you in everything your hands have produced. He knows that you have been traveling through va this vast desert. These 40 years Adonai your God has been with you, you have lacked for nothing. So we went on past our kinsmen, the descendants of Esau, living in Seir. 
We left the road through the Arabah from Elat and Etzion Geber and turned to the pass along the road through the desert of Moab. Adonai said to me, don't be hostile towards Moab, don't fight with them, because I will not give you any of their land to possess, since I've already given Ar to the descendants of Lot and as their territory. The Amim used to live there, a great Nuish people as tall as the Anakim. They are also considered Rephaim, as are the Anakim, but the Moabites call them Amim. In Seir, the Horim used to live, but the descendants of Esau disposed and destroyed them, or rather dispossessed and destroyed them, settling in their place. Israel did similarly in the land it came to possess, which Adonai gave to them. Now get going and cross the Wadi Sred. So we crossed Wadi Zered. The time between our leaving Kadesh Barnea and our crossing uh, Wadi Zered was 38 years until the whole generation of men capable of bearing arms had been eliminated from the camp, as Adonai had sworn they would be. Moreover, Adonai's hand was against them to root them out of the camp until the last of them was gone. When all the men who were, who were able to bear arms had died and they were no longer part of the people, Adonai said to me, today you are to cross the border of Moab at Ar. You are to approach the descendants of Ammon. Don't bother them, don't fight with them, for I'm not going to give you any of the territory of the people of Ammon to possess, since I've given it to the descendants of Lot as their territory. This too is considered a land of the Rephaim. Rephaim, whom the Amorai, the Amorites, call Zamzumim, used to live there. They were a large, numerous people, as tall as the Anakim. But Adonai destroyed them as the people of Ammon advanced and settled in their place, just as he destroyed the Horim as descendants of Esau advanced into Seir and settled in their place where they live to this day. It was the same with the Avim, who lived in villages as far away as Gaza, Gaza the Kotforim, coming from Kaftor, and destroyed them and settled in their place. So get up, get moving, and cross the Arnon Valley. Here, I have put in your hands Sichon, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, in his land. Commence the conquest. Begin the battle. Today I will start putting the fear and dread of you into all the peoples under heaven, so that there will be mention of your name, so that the mere mention of your name will make them quake and tremble before you. I sent envoys from the Kedemot desert to Sichon, king of Heshbon, with a peaceable message. Let me pass through your land. I'll keep to the road, turning neither right nor left. You will sell me food to eat for money and give me water to drink for money. I only want to pass through. Do as the people of Esau living in Seir and Moab living, with, uh, living in Ar did with me until I crossed the Jordan into the land Adonai, is, our God, is giving us. But Sichon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass through his territory because Adonai, your God, hardened his spirit and made him stubborn so that he could hand him over to you, as is the case today. Adonai said to me, See, I have begun handing over Sichon and his territory before you. Start taking possession of his land. Then Sichon came out against us, he and all of his people, to fight at Yahatz. And Adonai our God handed him over to us, so that we defeated him, his sons, all of his people. At that time, when, uh, at that time we captured all of his cities and completely destroyed every city, men, women, little ones. We left none of them. As booty for ourselves, we took only the cattle, along with the spoil from the cities we'd captured, from Aroer to the edge of the Arnon Valley, and from the city in the valley, all the way to Gilead. There was not one city too well fortified for us to capture. Adonai, our God, gave all of them to us. The only land you didn't approach was that of the descendants of Ammon, the region around the Jabok River, the cities and the hills, and whatever else Adonai, our God, forbade us to go. The result of the rebellion of that first generation of the Exodus, these are the subject of the words, the first words of chapter 2. They were literally required to march in the opposite direction from the promised land. They were told to head south towards the Gulf of Aqaba. 
What a dismal journey that must have been. Soundly defeated by the Amorites, under the sentence of death for all who were aged 20 or older, now they were relegated to living in a bleak desert for an indeterminate amount of time. Chapter 2 is a contrast to chapter 1. The first rebellion, or the first generation rebelled, but the second generation is being obedient. The first generation went southward, now the second generation is ordered to march northward. The first generation was to enter the promised land from the southwest, now the second generation is to enter the promised land from the southeast. The first generation was told they had stayed at Mount Horeb long enough. Now the second generation is told that they had been skirting the promised land long enough. The first generation knew they would die in the desert. But now the second generation knew they would live in God's set-apart land. Next we get a series of instructions. It's about certain people that the Lord wants Israel to avoid. And this avoidance is not about a fear within Israel. It's not about a worry that they might be defeated. Rather, it is that the territories inhabited by these people were not to be a part of the promised land. And the ancestry of the people involved, at least the people who currently occupied those territories, this was related to Abraham in some way. Now, as I mentioned in our last lesson this coming holy war for Canaan was not about conquering the world or gaining much wealth and treasure. It wasn't even an attempt to force the worship of Jehovah conversion on the various inhabitants there. This was but the taking of a specific piece of land that the Lord declared is His, not Israel's, His. This was not to be the creation of a Hebrew empire. The first nation with which Israel is to avoid conflict is Edom. Edom is another name for Esau, Jacob's twin brother. So there was a very close relation, a kinship rather, between Esau and Israel. Remember, Israel is just an alternative name for Jacob. Now, the command from the Lord to Israel is, be careful with Seir, which is yet another name, by the way, for the kingdom of Edom. The be careful doesn't mean be wary, be afraid. The Lord explains that the Edomites, they're going to be afraid. They're going to be alarmed at Israel. What is not said was well understood in ancient times. That when a people you feared came too near to you, what was your response? You went out in battle to try and bruise them to show them that a treaty would be a better idea. The idea is that Moses and the leaders of Israel need to do everything possible to make it clear to Edom they have no intention of either taking their territory, not even of taking any food or water from them. Therefore, Israel skirted the land of Edom. They continued northwards towards the Arabah that was in the region of Moab. Now, the Moabites, too, had a hereditary kinship with Israel, though not quite as close a one as they had with the descendants of Esau. The Moabites were the descendants of Lot, Lot who was Abraham's nephew. And for the sake of the patriarch Abraham, who loved Lot, the Lord had set apart for Lot's descendants some land. And Jehovah makes it clear that this land was not for Israel. They're to avoid conflict with Moab. Starting in verse 10, we get some interesting footnotes we're spending a few minutes with. We're told that people called the Emim formerly inhabited Moab. And these Emim are counted as Rephaim. Now sometimes we forget <clears throat> that a few centuries after the Tower of Babel incident with Nimrod, which took place about 300 years after the Great Flood, the world was sufficiently 
repopulated. That if a group of people migrated into a new land, chances are they had it either take that land from its previous owners or they settled there and perhaps grew into numbers that eventually dominated that area. When the descendants of Lot moved into the area of Moab and others of his descendants into the area of Ammon, these were already occupied territories. They didn't move in unders un uh, undiscovered. They didn't move in to unpopulated areas. The people who lived in Moab first were called the Amim, and only later did Lot's descendants become the ruling people of that territory. Now, this is not the first time we've encountered the term Rephaim. And here we're told that the Amim were to be counted as Rephaim. Well, the Rephaim are those post-flood versions of the Nephilim, who are a race of giants that existed before the Great Flood. There is a, only a precious little in the Bible about just what these Nephilim were, as the verses are a little bit ambiguous. Some see the Nephilim as an intermixing of the line of Seth with the line of Cain. Seth being the line of good from Adam and Eve, Cain being the line of evil from Adam and Eve. Others say the Nephilim were a product of fallen angels who had sex with human women. And the sons who were the products of this illicit mixture were powerful, fierce, unusually large, and unusually evil men. These men, these Nephilim, married other women, and over long periods of time, their dominance spread. Now, how their existence bridged the flood? Well, there's a good mystery, too. In other words, if all humanity except Noah's family was wiped out in the flood, how did the Rephaim appear? Or reappear after the flood. Did fallen angels repropagate in Noah's descendants? One line of thought is that it's the memory of the Nephilim that caused, uh, caused any unusually tall people to be labeled, simply labeled as Nephilim, and eventually the name evolved to Rephaim. Things like that happen. So it's not unlike us today seeing a seven-foot-tall basketball player and calling him a giant. We don't really mean giant like fee fi fo fum We just mean that they are at the outer boundaries of human height. They're a barren us by a lot. Now what adds to the mystery of the Rephaim, however, is Egyptian records from around the time of Moses that reports the finding of burial chambers that contained the human remains of men who were over nine feet tall. The Egyptians didn't have, by the way, a giant legend. At least none that's ever been found. Further, where the, they found these remains were in the former kingdom of Og, which is to say that they came from the Rephaim. I don't have any answers to all this, but boy, it's fascinating. And it can not be just so easily dismissed as a fairy tale. Well, verse 12 then explains that the area that Edom, which is here called Seir, and his descendants occupied were previously populated by another people called the Horites. But at some point, the descendants of Esau dispossessed them. And let's not overlook that the reason that the descendants of Esau were able to dispossess these Horites is because the Lord gave that land to Esau as his inheritance. So there is actually a precedence to Jehovah assigning land to nations of people, non-Hebrew people, just as it is to Israel. And the Lord insisting that because he made that divine assignment of territory to certain folks, it was to remain that way. Now let's tuck that away in our memory banks as we go forward and realize that the Lord is the Lord of all. He's not just the Lord of Israel. Verse 14 confirms that from the time that the time from the great rebellion 
of Israel's re leadership, meaning that 12 spies incident, until the time Israel finally crossed the border to enter Moab was 38 years. And it was during this 38 years that the first generation of the Exodus died out. And that was a prerequisite for the children to enter the promised land. And after passing through Moab, Israel was next to encounter Ammon. And by the way, that name ought to be familiar to you. It's the capital of Jordan, Ammon. We just say it differently now. And the same instruction is given regarding Ammon as for Moab and for Edom. Don't harass them. And that's because Ammon represents descendants of Abraham by means of Lot. And we're told that the living, uh, that, that living among the Amorites, there are some Rephaim, some of these giants. And the knowledge of which I'm sure made it easier for Israel to just avoid fighting with these people. And verse 20 tells us that the people whom the Ammonites displaced, in other words, those who were first living there, were also called the Zamzumim. This word is interesting because in a dynamic translation, it means something like this. The people whose speech sounds like buzzing like the buzzing of bees. And that's kind of spooky on the service, but I think it just means that their manner of speech, at least to the Hebrew ear, was odd. And it must have been a kind of high-pitched vocalization. Then there's this people mentioned who are called the Avim, a people who first occupied an area that we currently call Gaza an area that would eventually be occupied by the Philistines. Well, after all of this genealogy and history, which I find fascinating, the order is given to Israel to charge. Let the holy war of the taking of Canaan begin. And the first words of verse 24 are essentially a war cry. Up! Arise! A few words later, it says, begin the occupation. So far in Deuteronomy, we've read about the various people Israel is not to go to war with. But now we get a list of people they are to fight against. And of course, it begins with the Amorites. Why do I say of course? Because chapter 2 is a contrast of chapter 1. Chapter 1 ends with the people of Israel starting an unauthorized holy war, an unholy war, if you would, with the same Amorites and getting thoroughly trounced. Now, in chapter 2, God's call is for them to attack the Amorites. Now it's a true holy war. So victory is not only assured, but from the spiritual point of view, the war is even over. We'll pick up chapter 2 next week. Please rise. Thank you.